And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season we pick a topic and then we find six movies all related to said topic. But wait, there's more. After that, we select one of those movies and give you some behind-the-scenes facts on how and why the movie got made. But wait, there's more. After that, we give you a full review of the movie from start to finish, filled with snarky comments and a bunch of stupid voices and possibly some random stories about things that happen to us in the real world. <laughs> it's a delightful time. I'm Chad Cooper, one of your hosts, and along with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we are wrapping up Season 24's theme, Pop Culture Club, featuring half a dozen movies based on pop culture nonsense. For the finale, we have Masters of the Universe, based on the cartoon, based on the dolls, <laughs> I mean action figures, which were based on some businessman's fever dream to make money off of stupid kids in the 1980s, of which I was one. This movie has swords and sorcerers, hunky guys and S&M garb, time travel, chicken and ribs in a bucket. Man, how could this movie be bad? Well, guess what? It is. And to set the table for this buffet of disappointment, let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to tell us all about how this movie leapt from the small screen to the big screen with a faceplant belly flop of epic proportions. Bo, get in here and start the beginning of the end for this disastrously disappointing season based on things that people barely remember. In 1945, in a garage in Los Angeles, a new business launched. Harold Manson, Ruth Handler, and her husband, Elliot Handler, birthed Mattel Creations. At first, the company made picture frames and dollhouse furniture and managed to stay above water, but this was no Fortune 500 company. I guess there's not much money in dollhouse furniture, even in the 1940s. When Harold Manson took sick in 1947, he sold his stake in the company to the handlers, and Ruth became the real star of the show, managing the business while her engineer husband came up with his designs for something that would make Mattel Creations a real success. And in 1947, they had an early hit with a ukulele called Yuka Doodle. In 1950, they got the rights to sell the Magic 8 Ball, and all signs pointed to success. Less than a decade later, in 1959, Mattel offered the first series of Barbie dolls, which would become the company's best-selling toy in, well, ever. A year later, in 1960, they offered the Chatty Cathy, a doll that talked and creeped out absolutely nobody. It was the first of the pull-string dolls, and Mattel revolutionized the market with it. By 1960, the company that started in the El Segundo, California garage was listed on the New York Stock Exchange, a genuine and undeniable success. They continued to capitalize on their successes by introducing the Ken doll to the Barbie line, along with the Barbie Dreamhouse, and used the technology from the Chatty Cathy doll to make the CNC toy, which introduced the sound a cow makes to a generation of children. In 1968, Elliot Handler found his son playing with little toy cars called Matchbox cars due to their small size and propensity to burst into flame. I didn't fact check all of this copy from the interns, but that last part really doesn't sound right. Whatever. Anyway, Handler's son loved the cars, and Elliot saw an opportunity to do something both the same but different. The cars were too small to put a clock in, so he did another thing that was different. Where Matchbox cars would be realistic depictions of everyday automobiles, what Handler envisioned was something grander, more exciting. And to capture that excitement, he named his new line of toy cars Hot Wheels. They would be exotic designs, race cars and muscle cars, the kinds of cars that either existed only in fantasy or were so different in concept and design that they could not be mistaken for any old car you would see on the street. There were crazy paint jobs and superchargers and hood blowers and a bunch of car stuff I know about but don't really understand. And along with Harry Bentley Bradley and Jack Ryan, Mattel released 16 original Hot Wheels designs and the toy world was turned on its head. They were immensely successful, partly due to the outrageous designs of the cars and partly due to the engineering. The wheels of the Hot Wheels cars were wide, hard plastic, unlike the narrow tires of metal or plastic used by Matchbox. The result was simple and profound. Hot Wheels cars rolled faster. 
And so, when Mattel launched a racing track set in the late 1960s, one could put the cars through their miniature paces. And now, we must pause to talk TV. In the 1960s, there was great controversy on how advertising affected the children watching it. The claim was that children are too stupid to understand that most advertising was a bunch of horse shit intended to make you buy shit you don't need and eat shit that will make you fat or kill you or both. In 1952, congressional hearings took place focused on violence, but the Federal Communications Commission also mentioned advertising as an issue. The research showed that most dumb kids couldn't tell the difference between the show they were watching and the commercials in between it. The FCC and broadcasters generally allowed 16 minutes of advertising aimed at children per hour during early morning weekday hours and only 9.5 minutes during prime time. Which brings us back to Hot Wheels. In an effort to further the brand, Mattel sponsored a series called Hot Wheels. It was the story of Jack Rabbit Wheeler, a high school student who led the Hot Wheels Racing Club. He and his friends would race and get in all kinds of adventures. It was really quite something. Almost right away, the FCC began receiving complaints from other toy companies who said that the show was a half-hour Saturday morning advertisement for Hot Wheels toys and wasn't there some kind of rule against advertising that long to kids. The FCC said, all right, all right, we'll write a letter to ABC and that should do the trick. ABC said they never actually advertised any of the toys during the show. The club just so happened to be called the Hot Wheels Racing Club, and the show just happened to be called Hot Wheels, which happened to be the name of a top-selling line of toy cars, but that's just happenstance. The FCC came down hard and ordered ABC to log part of the runtime of the shows as advertising. Wait, that doesn't seem too draconian. Huh, no wonder kids are so stupid. But the war between advertising, the FCC, and cynical cash-grab cartoons had begun. Mattel took another stab with Creepy Crawlers, based on their Easy Bake Oven-like toy, that made little plastic bugs in a low-watt oven. There was G.I. Joe, which not only sold the toys, but kind of glorified war in a weird way, or Care Bears, which told tales of adventures with the stuffed animals. But all of that is prelude to the real star of this story, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. The idea had been kicking around Mattel since the early 1970s when they workshopped toys based on Conan the Barbarian, if thematically and not by name. And then Mattel made a serious and money-losing mistake when the CEO of Mattel in 1976, Roy Wagner, was approached by the Star Wars folks to make a line of toys based on the upcoming movie. When Mattel declined, the rights to the Star Wars toy merch fell to Kenner, who proceeded to make about a kajillion dollars on it. After seeing Kenner rake in all that money, Mattel tried a few sci-fi efforts of their own in the action figure space, but nothing ever caught on. The origins of He-Man, the idea that did catch on, are debated. A guy named Roger Sweet says he was the first to come up with the design and concept for He-Man, somewhat inspired by the art of Frank Frazetta, but Mattel, perhaps to keep from paying Sweet more than what they wanted, says Sweet's idea began as a character named Torok from a prototype designer named Mark Taylor. Regardless of its origin, Sweet took character models from the Big Jim action figure franchise and added more bulk and took a plaster cast of these new, bigger Big Jims. The idea was all in the name. With a character called He-Man, you could basically drop him into any universe and he could be the big, burly hero of the moment. He pitched three versions of He-Man to the CEO of Mattel, Roy Wagner. One was a soldier type, one was a bounty hunter reminiscent of Boba Fett from the Star Wars franchise, and the third, the one that Wagner responded to, was an axe-wielding barbarian. Once He-Man was a go at Mattel, they had to round out the cast of characters surrounding their signature hero. These would be called the Lords of Power, at least at first. Some folks within Mattel thought that using the word Lords might sound a little churchy, so the name was changed to Masters of the Universe. Taylor, the guy who designed a potential inspiration for He-Man called Torak, you may recall, designed Skeletor based on one of his own drawings called The King of Sticks. Looking at that sketch from 1971, you can see some of Skeletor's trademark armor and lots of little details that would make Skeletor such a good villain. Along with He-Man and Skeletor, the line of toys would launch with Man-at-Arms, Beast-Man, and Battle Cat which had been a Tiger and the Big Gem line before being adapted to the new Masters of the Universe series. 
To set the stage for the characters, Mattel explored the idea of doing a comic series based on a suggestion from their marketing director, a guy named Mark Ellis. Ellis worked with DC Comics to make a mock-up of an origin story, but Toys R Us, who were heavily in the toy game up until the bottom fell out of the toy story industry, balked at the idea of a comic. Five-year-olds don't read, they said. So Mark Ellis decided that if kids don't read, you could beam He-Man straight into their brains with a TV special. But then came a fateful meeting with the head of animation studio Filmation, Lou Scheimer. Much more than a single special was in the works for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe after that. The toy line launched in 1982, and Mark Halperin was brought in to help craft a series bible for the forthcoming animated series based on those toys. Halperin was a successful playwright and author and managed to shape the story into something Shakespearean with good and evil, secret identities, and a gothic castle filled with an awesome power at the center. Mattel and Filmation took the series to ABC, who passed. Likewise, the other major networks. So, Filmation said to hell with those guys, and they took the series into what's called barter syndication. Basically, that meant that TV stations could license the show directly from Filmation. The gamble to do so turned out to be a huge win. When He-Man and the Masters of the Universe debuted in September of 1983, it became the first syndicated show to be based on a toy. Within a year, it was seen on 120 TV stations across the U.S. By the middle of 1985, that number was 152, and the show was the most popular series among 2 to 11-year-olds, which feels right given the simple, if moralistic, plots. And of course, there was another controversy. Much like Hot Wheels, both the toys and the show, He-Man was accused of being one great big commercial for the toys. In fact, the UK banned He-Man toys from being advertised during the show to ensure some kind of break in the marketing. But the show itself was noteworthy for depicting some actual violence. Short little of it was He-Man hacking away with his sword, preferring to pick bad guys up and throw them around instead of eviscerating them. But this was still a big deal for children's programming at the time. And it was successful enough to spin off a whole other series about He-Man's cousin, She-Ra. But all things must end, and He-Man ran out of steam as a series in 1985. The toy line would run out of steam a couple of years later, bolstered by the success of the She-Ra spinoff. The series was rebooted a couple of times, most recently with Clerks director Kevin Smith behind a Netflix relaunch of the show. But nothing has matched the juggernaut of the 80s phenomena. Which brings us to the inevitable movie. I mean, it was a successful toy line, a successful animated series. How could the movie not be good, or at least profitable? The whole thing started with Edward Pressman, a producer who not only made some very good movies like Das Boot and Conan the Barbarian, but he had a company called Pressman Toys, which, you guessed it, was a gaming company. With a foot in the world of toys and a foot in the world of cinema, it made sense for Pressman to do the thing. Director Gary Goddard wanted on board this movie from the beginning. Goddard had never directed a feature film before, uh uh-oh, but he had worked as an Imagineer at Disney, designing some of the attractions at Epcot. And he also had worked in games. In fact, the characters depicted in Candyland, Lord Licorice, King Candy, Princess Lolly, They were all characters from Goddard's company and bore the likeness of his business partners. Of course, Goddard himself was King Candy. Goddard had also designed the Conan the Barbarian stunt show for Universal Studios with his new production company, so while movies may not have been his thing, putting together a spectacle and making games certainly were. By the time Goddard was sniffing around for the job, a script was already in place for the movie. Written by David O'Dell, who also wrote Supergirl, oh, double O, the story involved He-Man's mother being from Earth, linking Earth and Eternia, and had a bunch of business with Snake Mountain and lots of action in Eternia. When Pressman and Goddard met, Goddard liked the script and Pressman said he believed in first-time directors, but Mattel had to give him the green light too. Having worked with Goddard before as a game maker, Mattel knew the guy, trusted the guy, and everything looked like a go. Mattel had also approved of Dolph Lundgren for the part of He-Man as part of the package. So the script was there, the director was there, and our He-Man had come pre-approved. 
and Lundgren was coming in hot after his turn in Rocky IV as Ivan Drago. But his celebrity did not account for his speaking voice, which was immediately a problem for Goddard. If you recall, the only line he has in Rocky IV is, I must break you. The guy certainly looked the part, but... Goddard fully acknowledged Lundgren's hard work to get his voice right for the role, but he still wanted to use an actor to dub He-Man's lines. Since Lundgren was getting a bunch of money to be the star, no producer wanted to shell out more money to not hear the guy they paid. Speaking of money, when Pressman went to Warner Brothers for a budget for this epic sci-fi fantasy space drama, Warner only wanted to shell out $15 million to make the movie. The upstart Canon Group said they'd go as high as $17.5 million. And so, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe would end up in the hands of Canon Films. With the lower budget, much of the attorney and stuff had to be ditched from the script, so Odell decided to make a fish-out-of-water story, with He-Man showing up beaten and bruised on the doorstep of two humans, Kevin and Julie. And Goddard wanted to book in the movie with the attorney and stuff, so the Earth setting felt less like a compromise for budgetary reasons. Enter the throne room set and all the business with the moon rising and all that mess we'll talk about in a few minutes. Frank Langella was brought on as Skeletor, and Langella jumped at the chance when he was offered the role. His son was four at the time, and Langella recalled him running around the house with his He-Man action figures, shouting, I have the power! And Goddard knew him from his stage performance of Amadeus, and he believed that Frank Langella could act through all that makeup, which was true. With a star that was, shall we say, voice-challenged, Goddard secretly planned to hang the whole movie on Skeletor and his partner in crime, Evil Lynn, played by the pale-eyed beauty Meg Foster. What Goddard chose to omit from the script was the characters of Orko and Battle Cat, which would have required putting a guy on strings, by Goddard's thinking, and that would have ruined the whole movie, and Battle Cat would have had to have been stop-motion at best, which also would have cheapened the already budget challenge film. So both of those characters were thrown away. And then he got Courtney Cox, who was just the girl from the Bruce Springsteen video at the time. And when she got the part in Masters of the Universe, the story goes that she came in for an audition, and while Goddard liked her, he didn't think she looked right for the part. She looked a little too old. The casting director brought Cox back in the next day, this time without any makeup, and Goddard was convinced she could play the suburban girl next door after all. Goddard chose to shoot as much of the movie at night as he could, partly because this would hide some of the makeup and highlight the laser blast effects and so forth. But thematically, Goddard never bought the idea of these characters existing in the daylight. I might call that a problem. Another problem, with Canon Films being behind the money and their business starting to teeter toward bankruptcy, there was no time for rehearsals or getting fight choreography right. It was a whole lot of winging it. Changes to the script, changes to the characters, changes to the core of the movie, all real seat of the pants. And then, the money completely ran out. Before the final battle between He-Man and Skeletor could be shot, Cannon pulled the plug on funds. There was no more money to make this movie. Goddard and the producers negotiated with Mattel, who had never paid all of their rights money to the movie makers, for enough money to complete two more days of shooting, and so the end was completed on borrowed money with borrowed time. When the movie was completed, Cannon couldn't even afford a cast and crew screening. It hit theaters on August 7th, 1987, and it was a terrific disappointment. Third place the opening weekend behind the James Bond film The Living Daylights and that Emilio Estevez Richard Dreyfus movie Stakeout, which is a real stay tuned for this show. The movie only made $5 million in its opening weekend, and within a month, it was out of theaters completely. But despite the fact that this movie came out a couple of years after the toy line peaked and ended, the cartoon shuttered its windows, and most of the world had moved on, does that mean the movie is really bad? Oh, buddy. Just you wait. Let's get chatting here for a trip to another world, and then right back to Earth for most of its runtime. Ladies and gentlemen, he men and evil lens, it's 1987's Masters of the Universe.
Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Pick 6 Movies. And yes, I do have the power. Not only do I have the power, though, with me as ever is the man to my he, Chad Cooper. I've got the power! I've been waiting all week to say that. So we are doing, as you heard in the introduction, Masters of the Universe. Mm Mm-hmm. A movie adaptation of the popular animated series and the toy line and was fit in this season because this is a story of a pop culture phenomenon. Like He-Man the Masters of the Universe was a big deal when yes, we were it was kids. a very big deal and you and i were are of the age that this was part of my childhood i remember leaving the hospital where my grandfather was dying with my mother he was dying of cancer mm-hmm. and saying to my mom hey um he man comes on at 4 30 so can we wrap this up <laughs> You mean his life? <laughs> hey, Grandpa, can you, uh, you know, ick. However you want to interpret that. I just needed to see me some He-Man. I get it. I get it. It was a big deal, so much so that a lot of young children murdered grandparents to get to the screen. Yes. Mm-hmm. You just get a pillow. <laughs> right. And then you say, I have the power! <laughs> right. And then you do what we like to call the cuckoo Snuffleupagus. <laughs> and, yeah. So, I don't know that I was a particular fan of He-Man in the masters of the universe the cartoon at least sure Uh, i had some of the action figures but i think when you turn 12 they just got handed to you i had a bunch of the action figures until i became a bit of a pyromaniac (laughs) and then i went into the woods behind my house Uh and with some lighter fluid or kerosene or whatever and just burned them up that was the same fate that the gi joes that i had shared right and so i'm familiar with that move on one particular day i was melting true story a beast man with lighter fluid and matches that i stole from a a pizza inn not stole but you know Mm-hmm. reached up and yoink and um a big hunk of the orange beast man uh, plastic fell off and just smeared across my hand and burnt the shit out of my hand and it hurt and i ran inside and i put ice on it to clean it up and then my mom told me we were all going to dinner at captain d's mm-hmm. and i went to captain d's just writhing in pain and i couldn't <laughs> tell her i'd been outside burning he-man figures so i sat there with my hand like a paw stuck in a cup full of ice and water at captain d's trying not to wince and cry and then my mom looked at me she was like what's wrong and i said i just miss grandpa so much (laughs) oh wow that is (laughs) grim true story yeah well i mean the telling of it now is at the time you were (laughs) deceptive to say the least oh to say the least yeah (laughs) (laughs) he man the masters the universe as as you heard in the introduction there's a lot of conan in it there's a lot of star wars in it Mm -hmm. there's a lot of sexy guys in it and look i'm a career heterosexual much to the the dismay of a lot of our listeners Mm -hmm. yeah we get a lot of letters yeah. I'm taken. But I will say, I've had two people in my life tell me that as young men in watching He-Man, that they were like, oh, I definitely knew that I was gay. The watching cartoon? this cartoon. Yeah. Really? I mean, it was just like sexy, rippled, bodybuilding cartoon guys just flaunting their muscular calves and their huge pecs and their biceps and just... I guess if that's your type, you know? Like, I'm looking for more of a cuddler, I guess. <laughs> Uh, how about we get into this movie? All right. So it starts off with the Canon logo, so you know what you're in for here. Yeah, Canon films. Been we make long. movies, sort of. <laughs> you know, it, which begs the question, and I'll ask this right out of the gate. Uh-huh. Is this better or worse than invasion usa which may be the best canon film worse yeah absolutely invasion usa is the greatest canon film of all time it's very good is it the greatest film of all time in general maybe it's part of the conversation (laughs) sure (laughs) (laughs) i like after that we get the title that says a gary goddard film Uh uh-huh and you're like "Uh oh right that's up there when you see a weinstein production you're like doesn't inspire confidence no music by gary glitter (laughs) (laughs) right filmed on location at epstein island oh uncomfortable special thanks to the staff of neverland ranch who know how to keep their mouth shut if they knew what's good for them (laughs) narrated by kevin spacey (laughs) (laughs) then we get a title credit for the name dolph lundgren followed Mm -hmm. by frank langella who 
are surprisingly not in this movie very much, in my opinion. It is shocking how little He-Man and Skeletor do not dominate the screen in this adaptation. Honestly, He-Man is in it about five minutes more than I am. <laughs> there are multiple times where you're watching it and you will think to yourself, is He-Man in this movie? Yeah. Oh, wait, there he is. But even when he shows up, he doesn't really show up. I mean, he's a no. nothing character. He feels like a tertiary character. He's not even B-plot. He's like a an, an NPC of this film. He just walks into the scene and he's like, hello there, and then walks out. And I can't chalk it up to like the George Miller style Mad Max scenario where Mad Max is the title of the movie, but is rarely the engine powering the movie. No, they just didn't know how to make a He-Man movie. This movie's all over the place. They just didn't know what the character was. He-Man's character is, he is good guy. That's their interpretation. Yes. In the reality of it, he is super man he has two personalities he's prince adam and he's mm -hmm. he-man and he pivots between the two some people know he's he-man some people don't that's how this shit works but they don't deal with any of that as we will get into in just a moment in a very super mario brothers style this movie does not care about what the original thing was about and is mm -hmm. just like hey we're gonna do our own thing and if you had inserted mojo nixon into this movie in the billy barty <laughs> role now maybe you got something <laughs> Whoa! I, I got this powers power. key, man. Powers in my pants. Gonna get you pregnant by 15. Like, what? We start with a pretty awesome matte painting. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. We haven't seen a matte painting like this since Kingdom of the Spiders. I was hoping you would make that <laughs> reference because you're right. And there is narration about how Castle Grayskull sits at the nexus of worlds between light and dark, protected by a beautiful sorceress. And uh -huh. she protects the power to be supreme, to be a master of the universe. We get the title of the movie, Masters of the Universe. Uh -huh. Then, Bo, the opening credits continue and this movie so desperately wants to be so many other films star wars superman back to the future ghostbusters it's got hints of all of these all over the place and the opening credits and even the music feels like superman the movie and i saw something in this movie but i never thought that i would ever see in my life the opening credits for this film begin with the words starring billy barty mm -hmm. like dolph lundgren and franklin jella they got their name above the title of the film but it didn't say starring those two that is implied starring billy barty that's right what when you think of billy barty who is a little person what movies or tv shows come to mind for you under the rainbow yeah anything else i remember him as the police captain from this screwball comedy called night patrol but he's kind of a one of those eponymous little people like if there was a little person in your movie he was probably going to be in it shockingly he wasn't in time bandits how'd that happen well he's not british he was the baby in the bride of frankenstein uncredited yeah he did a lot of voice work strangely yeah. And, and I think he's got a, a kind of interesting, iconic voice. And honestly, I think he is one of two people in this movie that seems to give a shit about the movie. Yeah. Well, he's starring in it. Yeah. They're like, Marty, we're giving you starring credit. Oh, really? Okay. He's really got a great agent at this time. He worked for 72 years in film and television. And That's if you crazy. don't know who Billy Barty is, he is essentially the walking, talking, living, breathing embodiment of Baby Herman from who framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think it's a compliment and an insult at the same time. I forgot he was in UHF. Yeah, and he was also in Foul Play mm -hmm. and a ton of TV. Yeah, if there was yeah. a little person in your TV show in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, it was Billy Barty. Legitimately, though, I think a pretty good act. You know, I, yeah, I mean, that's I mean, not to say that little people can't be good actors, but it wasn't just stunt casting. Like, it, it's sort of that Peter Dinklage thing, even though, you know, there's no station agent in Billy Barty. Marty's career. Nah, nah, Peter Dinklage is in a, a league light years beyond Billy Barty. 
But Billy Barty was at least, he could act. He wasn't just a little person filling the size requirements for certain roles. Right. Leprechaun, Billy Barty casting, you know. Sure. Cupid, Billy Barty here. Like, yeah. Troll, Billy Barty. Nah. Ewok, he wasn't an Ewok either. He had standards. His agent was like, look, you start in Masters of the Universe. You're not going to be an also <laughs> as Ewok at the end of the credits, all right? You're a star. <laughs> so this movie's credits go on introducing a bunch of people that you don't care about until the name Courtney Cox show up and you're like whoa 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 what mm -hmm. Courtney Cox Courtney Cox is to Masters of the Universe as Jennifer Aniston is to Leprechaun as Meg Ryan is to Amityville 3D and that by the way the second reference to Leprechaun in a show that we have guaranteed will contain at least seven <laughs> Leprechaun references so see if you can spot them all kids at the end of the credits we do get a and Meg Foster as Evil Lynn. Mm -hmm. Now, Meg Foster is the only woman that I can think of who perpetually looks like she has been <laughs> angered just enough to turn into She-Hulk. Meg Foster is the woman that you call when you're like, hey, what's that lady with the crazy eyes? But she's kind of sexy. Yeah, of she course. She looks good. I mean, it's not like her eyes are like weirdly gray green and she looks like she's possessed, which she does. Mm -hmm. But she's got a sharp jaw and a raspy voice. She looks like if Ali Sheedy was in The Exorcist. Oh, that's a good call. Meg Foster is great. She was in They Live with Rowdy Roddy Piper. She would make a good dominatrix. Sure. Like, just like whipping the shit out of you and telling you how awful you are. Oh, now you're talking. Yeah. Like, I'd give her a couple of bucks for that. Sure, a couple of bucks. Yeah, look, she is high-priced, to <laughs> say the least. And then, man, in the credits, Bo, we get a music by Bill Conti. And I was like, the guy who wrote Rocky's mm -hmm. theme and the Karate Kid, the right stuff, like that Bill Conti? And they're like, mm-hmm, that's right. Because you need an incredible composer to make music that sounds close enough to a John Williams score without getting sued by John Williams and his estate. Oh, uh, who did the Superman score? Jerry Goldsmith. Smith. I thought that was Williams. I don't think so. I'll verify this, but it is 100% like somebody saying, hey, we need some music that sounds like Superman the movie. That, is, that was the task. It was John Williams. You're right. Uh, for some yeah. reason, for years, I've been thinking that it's You're Jerry thinking Goldsmith. Superman 3 because you got your head up your ass with canon films. I can't <laughs> stop. Bill Conti is to John Williams as Ray Parker Jr. is to Huey Lewis. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to really put that on the whiteboard and break it down what the ghostbusters theme and i want a new drug huh oh okay huh? yeah yeah huh? i forgot huh? all about that you're right you're right <laughs> so but after all the the credits there's like a big explosion that's like kaboom the credits are done and yeah. then we get another matte painting yep which is the desert but it's just a bunch of soldiers being led through a desert like apparently the, some war is going on and yeah. by the way kids don't expect to get much explained about any of this and you know what's crazy about this movie Bo, is that that as a fan of the original cartoon, the whole movie was about the battle for Castle Grayskull. Will He-Man maintain control of it to keep power in check? Or would Skeletor come in and take over and become the bad guy, right? This movie begins after the core concept of the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe narrative having taken place. Yeah, uh, Skeletor won. It's over. Literally, after we get that shot... It starts with him just strolling into Castle Grayskull, being like, mm -hmm. but guess what? I won. To the Unperial March. Like, what did you call it? <laughs> Unperial. <laughs> right. <laughs> Duel of the Fats. Lawyers? Thumbs up. He's, he's okay. Every fifth note is different. And All Evil right. Lynn strolls up to Skeletor and is just like, yes, we are closing in on Billy Barty. And He-Man is leading the resistance, but we'll have him by the end of the day. End of the day? <laughs> what? Right. Really quick timetable. And then she says, after all this time, Grayskull is ours. And that's where Skeletor is like, but, 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 let me stop you right there. Grayskull is mine. When you say ours, are you referring to a little mouse in your pocket? <laughs> 
Because I'll kill him too. <laughs> I assume you're talking about the royal we. And they are going to capture the most powerful being in their universe by the end of the day. At the opening of this movie, they have captured the iconic thing that sits in the nexus between good and evil. They've got the yes. sorcerers and some force field we're going to see in a minute. And th we also get our first big look. Like there's kind of this dramatic whip around us. Skeletor faces the camera. And high def does nothing to help the makeup job of this movie, which sure. needs all the help it can get it would be like if you were making a lord of the rings adaptation and you just started off with all the bad guys having the ring yeah that's kind of the whole thing yeah we know but we're moving on he goes up to the sorceress who again is in this kind of force field played by an actress named christina pickles mm -hmm. who actually won an emmy for her role on saint elsewhere and she was also the mom of ross and monica on the tv show friends mm -hmm. which made me wonder do you think she and courtney cox swap stories about being in this shitty movie oh probably right <laughs> at first i thought it was helen mirren slumming it back in the 80s but i was like oh no it's just uh christina pickles slumming it back in the 80s more like helen mirren <laughs> Skeletor is giving her the business about, as soon as Moonfall comes, all the power in the universe will be mine. <laughs> and the sorcerer's like, hey, hang on, hold your horses there. You ain't won nothing yet, Skeletor. I know I'm trapped in your little force field or whatnot, but look, He-Man is still alive. And let me just say this. Darkness cannot destroy the light, okay? It can mm. only hide it. That is good. That is good. Someone write that down. When she's dead, I'm gonna put that into my book of one-liners. Mm. And then he, like, zaps her or something with his force powers. Like, he basically is Emperor Palpatine. Take this! Kapow, kapow! <laughs> yeah. I, I learned that from my friend, the Emperor over in Star Wars. His was blue, mine's pink. Lawyers, thumbs up. You're good. And then he tells Evil Lynn to activate the Hollow Sphere. Mm -hmm. And because every now and again, Skeletor just gets lonely and like calls up the battlefield. Hey, hello, hey, hey soldiers, <laughs> me, Skeletor, and people of Eternia. As you are probably all aware, I've taken over the planet, the sorceress. She's here. She's my prisoner or something. I don't know. Anyway, according to my people. People, he man the most powerful man in the universe he's gonna be my slave by the end of the day don't ask what kind of slave but <laughs> it's going to be good anyway <laughs> now according to my my number two evelyn it's evelyn excuse me uh, it's evil lynn evelyn e evil i'll, I'll e write it down for next time but evil lynn it's two words I, i've been calling her evelyn for three years i, I know are you sure? Did she just... How would she... Hmm. All right. <laughs> I thought it was an apostrophe. I didn't... That's how I've been writing it. It's a hyphen. You put a hyphen. It's evil hyphen Lynn. But if you put the apostrophe, it's Evelyn. It's a hyphen, you moron. All right. Agree to disagree. <laughs> but against this backdrop uh, of or this green screen, more accurately, we finally meet He-Man as Dolph Lundgren, who just kind of turns around to face the camera to be a big sack of beef. He's got this glorious mullet. Yeah. It, <laughs> he's looking up at this sky-sized hologram of skeleton shouting at everybody and nobody all at once and then we see <laughs> some soldiers that are apparently bad guy soldiers right because they're in kind of black gray armor and they're they've got billy Barty who is dressed up as some kind of wicked w warwick or half elf or something you see them walking they've got like a long stick mm -hmm. and there's this net beneath them and they're carrying it's a doll it's not even an actor like it clearly looks like a prop there's no body movement whatsoever all also, I need to point out that this movie so desperately wants to be the next generation Star Wars. All of the lackey, disposable bad guys, they're stormtroopers, but they're dark stormtroopers. It's just instead of white, their metal is black. They're carrying Billy Barty and all of this Gwildor makeup. Gwildor is the name of the character. Uh huh. And then He Man just attacks. And one of the big problems of this movie presents itself in this scene, which is how bad the editing is. Yes. Among many other things. Agreed. Right. It, not the only problem. One of the problems. And it's just this really awful action scene where they're shooting lasers at him and he's re 
reflecting it with his sword like it's a lightsaber. Also, Bo, I went back and spot checked some He-Man cartoons because they didn't really use guns or blasters at all. Like there was a little bit of magic and you might get some sort of like hocus pocus alakazam type stuff. This movie is filled with people shooting guns and shit. And I was like, this would be like if you made a a Scooby-Doo adaptation and you gave Fred and Shaggy (laughs) AK-47s. It does not belong in this universe at all. I don't like this combination of fantasy and science fiction. Like, I think that can work in some situations, but like we saw a little bit of it with John Carter, and I don't think it really worked there. And then we see it again here, and I don't think it really works here. I think it's something that's tough to get right. Yeah. If you've got a sword, then why all the blasters? And if you got a blaster, you definitely don't need a sword. No, you just shoot them. That's why cops in America don't walk around carrying like katanas yeah 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 yeah. it's like this works a lot better from a from a a, a greater distance bang he's down it's really something and and by something i mean terrible yeah and so he kills a bunch of dudes and then after everybody's kind of dead man at arms and tila show up who are these people bo the the movie doesn't really explain them at all they're just apparently friends of he-man who were like oh hey uh were you shooting people over here Oh, okay, well, uh, hey, it's me, uh, Man-at-Arms. And Tila, which, again, in the cartoon, Tila, who was a princess, sort of, Mm -hmm. she was essentially the lowest lane of the cartoon. She was this badass in the military, and she was there to protect Prince Adam, but she was unaware that Prince Adam was also He-Man, and her dad is Man-at-Arms, which this movie does not address at all until about 40 minutes later when Tila goes, thanks, Dad, and you're like, wait, huh? Dad, Dad? Dad, daddy o none of that seems clear here no but they all hug each other the woman who plays tila mm-hmm. is an actress named chelsea feel mm-hmm. who went on to marry scott bacala from quantum leap and star trek something something fame probably most recognizable from last boy scout yeah she got that after this yeah. in this movie her costume is not the high thigh cut white princess outfit from the cartoon she she looks like she's wearing a gray motion capture outfit. There's leather that uncomfortably looks like it's pushing her breast apart. Yeah. And then she also has leather around her hips and what appears to be an incredibly uncomfortable thong going up her ass crack. And they focus in on her ass a lot mm-hmm. in this movie. Well, sure. You got to do something to put the asses in the seats. I guess so. I can't remember the name of the guy who plays man at arms, but he looks just like David Axelrod, Obama's political consultant he's Uh got this big bushy mustache when he takes off his helmet he's really got a bald spot with a ridiculous comb over yes (laughs) as soon as you mentioned that to me off the air uh that's immediately what i fixed on (laughs) it was he he looks shockingly like david axelrod so man at axelrod says to he man he man thank the sorceress you're alive uh also a gray skull was taken by skeletor i was watching the first part of the movie earlier oh it's really fucked up anyway i think somebody betrayed us which they never explain that someone betrayed that hasn't come out i think the idea is when they learn that they use the cosmic key to get in gray skull that sort of oh nobody betrayed us they just used this thing but you're right nobody gives voice to that look why mention it either leave the line <laughs> out or say when you bring up the cosmic key like oh we weren't betrayed they use that to get inside castle gray skull right. and that explains the betrayal right That's and all then you our do. our hobgoblin gwildor he starts screaming ow ow <laughs> And then they just let this little abomination out and he walks over and he's like, I am Gwildor, locksmith and inventor. And you're like, do you know Yoda? (laughs) It's a real, like, we need an Orko slash Yoda for this movie, and that's what this is going to be. We got to talk about this. Again, I hate to go back to the source material. One of the main characters in the original show was a character named Orko, who was a sorcerer and kind of floated around. I do not understand why they didn't just name Gwildor Orko. It doesn't matter. It didn't float. Okay, great. You don't have the budget Mm -hmm. to make a flying little sorcerer. Just call him Orko. This is your Orko. It's not Gwildor. What the hell's a Gwildor? As soon as I saw him, and I had seen this movie before, but I was pretty sure, like, oh, this is Orko. And yeah. when he was like, I am Gwildor. 
Eldor, I'm like, oh, the fuck you are. You're yeah. Orko. You're, I mean, because you're fulfilling the same annoying character yes. kind of role. I- instead, he says, I'm a locksmith and inventor, and Skeletor's forces are hunting me. Mm-hmm. Hey, who wants to go back to my place and get ripped? And they're like, well, you know, war is almost over. Might as well. For what it's worth, first off, no one listening who's never seen this movie should ever watch it. Mm-hmm. Wildor, because it's played by Billy Barty, he's about three feet tall. He's got this, like, comeback big red afro, and there's a part down the middle, and he's got a matching beard. He's got a long pointy nose, but his cheeks look like deflated scrotal sacks. <laughs> yeah, it's real droopy. Yeah, it's kind of gross. And every now and again, you can see his mouth moving behind the mouth, which yeah, always makes me laugh. Yeah, the prosthetics are terrible. Yeah. Because it's a canon film. They go to Gwildor's cave apartment, which is this movie's excuse for Yoda's home on Dagobah. Mm-hmm. It looks just like it. And then Man at Axelrod and Tila and He-Man, they enter this house, which is full of all these random inventions. And Gwildor says, Skeletor is after me because I invented this cosmic key that Skeletor stole. But guess what? I have another one. I have two cosmic keys. He's got one. I've got one. And it generates tones and music. And it can take you to any time or place in the universe. And then He-Man gives, I think, his first line of the movie. And he goes, those, those Skeletor's troops got into the castle and surprised us. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, anyway. What, what did he say? Were those words? <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, uh, is he gonna keep going like that? Oh, okay, so my race is a trusting one, and a beautiful woman came from Snake Mountain, and they're like, oh, that must have been Evil Lynn. No, no, she said her name was Evelyn. Oh, I don't know. Huh. Is he sleepy? Why does he talk that way? Huh. It, um, <laughs> so they stole the key, I guess is the point. Does he need to sit down? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe we should go into gray skull and just zap right in. Um, I, if you're saying we should use the key to do the same thing that they did, then Skeletor's key will locate our key. And then, is that what you said? <laughs> I, I'm going to say that's what you said. And then uh, we'll be caught. And that doesn't matter because immediately after he says this, it's like, knock, knock, knock. Um, Skeletor soldiers. And they're like, oh, no, we've got to get out of here through my secret passage that goes under the Castle Grey Skull. Man at Axelrod's like, uh, does this place have a back door? Yeah. Where is it? It's in the back. Oh, let's use it. We get a shot of the soldiers outside as they're trying to bust in to Billy Barty's joint. And we see this this weird dude named Karg, who is basically a guy who? who Karg, he's the one that's got the blown back white hair and looks a little bit like a chihuahua in the face. Oh, Karg. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with you. It's also crazy how they didn't use characters from the cartoon. They use Beast Man, who little, was yeah. one of Skeletor's henchmen. But for anyone who watched it, Trap Jaw, Merman, Triclops, Whiplash, these were all like your mainstay number twos or threes for any given episode and they don't use anyone but beast man and even when they use him it's barely it was kind of like the way the ninja turtles didn't use bebop and rocksteady they didn't really use them they could have you just did it and here it's crazy that they didn't leverage known ip for this film they kind of made up some shit like the mario brothers movie because no one stopped to think how we should be making a masters of the universe movie they were making a movie that's like oh we want to make something that's like star wars or we want to make something that's like superman or we want to make something that's like ghostbusters or back to the future anything else that was popular at the time and they never stopped to think about how they should be making a masters of the universe adaptation because again in just a few minutes we're about to leave this fantasy sci-fi world and go to the year 1987 where we're going to hang out at a used musical instrument store for the majority of the film and some dude's house like yeah this is a movie that begs to have a grand scale and it just continually shrinks throughout the movie which is not what you want your epic space fantasy adventure to do, is to feel right. smaller and smaller and smaller. So our heroes make their way to Grayskull using these passages underneath, and it's like, oh, well, that was easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> they didn't need the cosmic key at all. They just show up there, and the sorceress is like, hey, you guys are in danger. You got to get out of here. And <laughs> Dolph Lundgren is, <laughs> says, oh, and she says, um, yeah, I... 
Look, I can't get out of here, but I can resist Skeletor until Moonrise, and then the Great Eye opens on the universe, and then we're all fucked. So you got to figure something else out. <laughs> and then a bunch of soldiers come in, led by Evelyn. Mm-hmm. Skeletor then shows up too. It's like, oh, we have our dramatic ending of the movie at 15 minutes. We're going to be in and out of here quick. He-Man shouts out, let her go. And Skeletor just responds, no, I will keep the sorceress here until the great eye opens and then i'll have all the power and i'm skeletor and everyone will join me he man says uh, i think you want me you're, you're want me um uh, look i i know we're about to battle here but does anyone have a read on what he said <laughs> no okay evelyn chimes in the little red-headed weirdo he has another key and skeletor is like what there's one <laughs> great line read that frank langella has here where somebody says you can't dare like trap the sorceress like this and he goes i dare anything that's pretty good way to go frank langella for washing the shit off this gold nugget frank langella is to masters of the universe universe what bob hoskins was to that super mario brothers movie i don't think he fully realized the shit film he was in and was swinging for the fences Absolutely. And, and it's also crazy because the makeup for skeletor looks terrible like the level of emoting that he can do behind this piece of latex and plastic is only second to whoever the hell played michael myers in that spray painted william shatner mask you talk about like seeing his mouth behind it when he's yapping it, it looks like that woman in the chewbacca mass who cracked herself up outside that coals like rah, 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 rah. she looks like a ventriloquist dummy it's a step above a spirit halloween store costume but it's a small step above that slightly you got the deluxe version that allows you to put a piece of elastic under your chin mm-hmm. to at least give the appearance that when you talk the mask is talking to and you're also like you know what i could probably get a land shark bottle top in this mouth oh yeah i'm good to go for halloween they fight a little bit there's a battle that rages here and by rages i mean takes up some screen time then billy barty just dials up an escape route with this cosmic key thing he's got hey we could go anywhere any place any time in any universe just get on in here i do like the visual of the world kind of bending as the door opens up this was done by richard dykstra who did star wars and stuff like that did raiders of the lost ark like he's a great visual effects guy and most of it looks like shit because he was probably given two weeks and 15 dollars but this looks pretty good you say so look credit where it's due because we're about to get to some boring bullshit (sighs) in this movie so i'm trying to start at like what if this movie was like a seven not a ten just a seven and that's not what this movie is but we're gonna get to that all our heroes jump through this portal and they disappear to the year 1987 and on their way through the portal gwildor drops his cosmic key on the ground during this battle and everybody's gone to this other dimension but before it closes this cable with a three-fingered claw that you would find on an arcade claw machine it comes zip zapping back through the portal grabs the cosmic key and then yoinks it to 1987 as well which for me begged the question who shot that claw to grab that key i th- think that was billy barty who did that i think you're right but in watching it the first time i was like who has this technology i only know that because of what happens later which is not the way you want this to work in a movie where (laughs) it's like memento style where you're filming it backwards but anyway so he grabs the cosmic key the door closes and evil lynn is like oh that's not good um skeletor he seems to have disappeared with the cosmic key and at that point skeletor says well you have to go after them i must possess all or i possess nothing and you're like eh, boy you seem like a terrible boss when man at axelrod and tila again we still don't know who they are or what they do or their relationship to one another when they show up in the year 1987 they walk over and they find he-man pulling gwildor who is head first in this muck and mud mm-hmm. to save his life and man at axelrod and tila they just start laughing their asses off what a couple of assholes they finally get him out of this thing Thing, and Billy Barty is like, hang on, I gotta clean out my gills. And you're like, wait, you have gills? And right. sure enough, he just sprays water out of his disgusting face. And then He-Man says, uh, goodbye to eternity. 
Um, Same so- sorceress. Ah, um, <laughs> I'm, I've got a plan. Is he, did he hit his head when he came through the door? <laughs> anyway, well, we've got, we can get back, but we've got to find the key and that's missing. Also, when we got here, I just smashed a bunch of random keys. We could literally be anywhere at any time. At that point, He-Man is like, I'm going to perimeter. And yeah. probably Dave's sector. Tila jumps in, knocks him out of the way. She gets rough with Gwildor. She grabs him on the front of his jacket. And she's like, you got us here, you Therunian jackass. You get us home. She kind of gets violent quick. And I think she's racist. She's got a temper. For sure. <laughs> you know, it's a product of how she was raised. Yeah. And then they hear something moving in the bushes. Mm. And they're like, they've got this like alien style scanner to see what's coming. And sure enough, out of nowhere comes a loose cow. Tila, because of her short temper, she just pulls her gun on it. She's like, I'll shoot it. Right. I'm like, whoa, 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 Tex. Calm down. Billy Marty just starts mooing at it. Uh-huh. It's a, I know this scene is played for laughs at all, but it just feels demeaning to everyone involved. Speaking of which, uh-huh. this movie has zero humor. There's no character in the film that is the comic relief. And when this movie attempts at humor, it fails miserably, but it doesn't do it very often. It's not a fun movie to watch. Yeah. Nobody's having a good time, really. Well, definitely not the audience. Going back to one of the problems of the movie, like the editing is bad it's a bad script and acting is terrible cinematography is awful music is trash to that end it's not any fun like the movie doesn't have any fun with the premise and part of that is that he-man is such a nothing paper thin i'm just gonna say a few lines character i'm not on his side because i don't know what his side is other than he's good guy man at axelrod says hey everybody uh by my calculation we've got 0.84 gloop glurks to get back to save the sorceress before the the moon does something hey he man you, you got a plan and he man says cosmic key turn you uh Huh, listen, I'm going to rephrase that for He-Man here. Uh, I think what he's saying is, we're going to fight off two to 3,000 soldiers, uh, uh, free the sorceress, and then we're going to uh, sink our personal communicators and, and then go find this cosmic key. Is that what you're saying there, uh, He-Man? Ooh. Tila jumps in. She's like, what if I just shoot my gun at the ground repeatedly? That'll blast a hole back to Eternia. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, hey, Tila, let me just say, um, the, when you are uh, shooting up the place, that, that really puts a, uh, it's like an MRI of your soul, Tila, and, and you're not representing Eternia well, you're not representing uh, Grayskull well, and, uh, you know, you, you just want to think a little bit more about uh, who you're shooting, why you're shooting them, uh, and maybe we just need common sense Tila legislation. We're going to come together, we're going to form a coalition between the four of us, and we're going to go, we're going to break out, and we're going to go, and we're going to find the cosmic key this is a, this is a game of addition it's not a game of subtraction that's what we've got to do let's not make this like a, a bad mood either like, hey everybody good journey good journey everybody and everybody's like uh yeah good journey weirdo <laughs> yeah for those of you who do not speak eternian uh uh si se puede is that is that how we're gonna say this here you know that's what we're gonna say then we cut away from the movie that we've been in for a while uh-huh to courtney cox working a job at some kind of country fast food joint yeah it's this a-frame small town diner in nowheresville america and outside this place they've got signage that shows their signature items which include but are not limited to chili dogs dogs french fries hot dogs which i'm like well first off jackass if you got chili dogs one can surmise that you also have hot dogs yeah. you don't need to print that up there and then they also proudly serve ribs and chicken and jumbo shrimp come on man pick like one or two things that you do very well and promote that you're spreading yourself way too thin here robbie's on route 12 if you go around the side of the building you see sushi spaghetti steak breakfast served 24 hours a day <laughs> and apparently courtney cox is going to school in new jersey question mark i don't think she's going to school i don't know where she's going or what she's doing she's dressed in this little cowgirl outfit and then the movie just gives us this dump of exposition from her to set up these plot lines that do not belong in a masters of the universe movie she says to her co-worker i never thought i'd be this sad serving shitty food to these rubes for the last time now that i'm moving to new jersey and breaking up with my longtime boyfriend since seventh grade because we both changed and my parents have always 
always wanted me to move 3,000 miles away from this small town. One, why is she going to New Jersey, Bo? Why not send her to New York? They don't explain that she's going there to like live with her aunt or a school. Speaking of not explaining things, then her boyfriend, Kevin, who she was just talking about, picks her up mm-hmm. in a limo? No, he picks her up in a rape van. Is like, that the what kind it of is? Thing like, who's driving? You- he is. He's driving the van. It's one of those vans that you trick a fat girl into helping you move a couch. All right. You throw her down in a hole and cut off her skin. <laughs> you dance around with your cock tugged up in your ass cheeks. Is Courtney Cox a great big fat person? <laughs> Yeah, if you could just help me get this couch in my van. <laughs> Courtney Cox goes out and climbs into the front seat with her boyfriend, who she earlier said she's going to break up with because she's moving to New Jersey 3,000 miles away. Which also, but I just was like, where is this town? Yeah. Because Los Angeles is 2,700 miles from New Jersey. Like, are you in Vancouver? <laughs> I think she's rounding <laughs> up from Dayton. I guess so. So she jumps in and Kevin is like, so you coming to sound check or what? Do you have time to come to, to where I'm playing musical instruments? Do you know how to not scream? <laughs> where we're doing the sound check, there's only one door and that's going to be changed when you get in. So don't be <laughs> suspicious or worry about that. Also, uh, if you see any death's head moss, that's... It's just a hobby of mine. <laughs> By the way, have you thought of taking a later flight or no flight at all? And she's like, no, 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 I gotta get the Would fuck out Would you mind putting your passport and your driver's license in the glove box for safekeeping? I like to keep them in a cedar box as trophies. <laughs> Listen, I, I gotta get on this plane, but can you take me to the cemetery first? And he's like, oh, cemetery, done and done. <laughs> They got the cemetery where she's like says goodbye to her parents who are, have mysteriously died. We don't know how they died yet. I mean, she could have killed him for all we know at this point in a real Menendez slaying. Is it here that she tells him, like, I- I'm so terribly sad because my parents are dead and it's my fault that they're dead because they got on a plane and I thought it would be funny and I shot one of those laser pointers up in the air and their plane crashed. <laughs> you really can't blame yourself. Mostly because I had way more to do with that than you did. I I said too much. <laughs> Cut to Tila with her gun drawn, as always. Uh-huh. And she rushes over to Robbie's rib and chicken shack. And she finds Man at Axelrod hiding in the bushes. And Tila says, can I shoot somebody? And he's like, uh, no, I think that'd be a bad idea. She's like, come on, father. And you're like, father? This is how we find out that you two are related? You just tell us now? Yeah. <laughs> and so they also <laughs> see billy barty snooping around this place and he's got his like grappling hook thing that he uses just to swipe a bucket of ribs as well as some sides from the back of a car where a bunch of kids are making out so these two teenagers drove to robbie's ribs and chicken shack ordered a bucket of chicken and ribs then put it in the back seat of their open convertible while they what worked up an appetite sticking their tongues in and out of each other's mouths Mm mm-hmm Tila and Man at Axelrod and Gwildor, they start chawing down on the chicken and ribs. And then Gwildor grabs a bucket of barbecue sauce and just downs it. And it runs all down his face. It's vile. (laughs) And then Tila gets grossed out when it is discovered that they're eating animal meat off of bones. But this movie pauses for about 60 to 90 seconds to just watch three characters eat ribs. Three minutes of a movie that's what, an hour and 41 minutes or so? Yeah. It's good. It's... Oh, hey, did you, did you try the spicy? Oh, oh mm. Try the two sauces together. Sweet and spicy. Mm. Oh my god, that is delicious. Mm. You know what? The coleslaw is surprisingly good. G- give me that. Give me some of that. Did you, uh, oh, did you try the biscuits? Salad? The biscuits, I think, are fresh cooked daily. <laughs> and it goes on forever. Is that Irish or Southern potato salad? Let me try a little bit of that. Oh, it's oh, Southern. Oh, you can really taste that mustard. <laughs> Just the right amount of black pepper. <laughs> I didn't think I'd like the celery, but it really adds a crunch I like. (laughs) They stopped this movie to eat ribs. Uh Uh-huh. In the Masters of the Universe movie. And that's the whole scene. We don't learn anything else other than the fact that they like ribs. Three of these characters, two of which you know from the cartoon, stop to eat ribs for a period of time, like in the bushes. Uh huh. Yeah, no wet wipes. They're just wiping their hands on leaves and shit. 
And meanwhile, Courtney Cox <laughs> and Kevin are at the cemetery saying goodbye to her parents. And this is where she says the Uh-oh. thing about this is all her fault. And uh, I got ahead of myself on that. Yeah, and uh, who cares? <laughs> and then Kevin is like, look, you can't change things. That only happens in fairy tales. And you can't make things happen unless you want to. Unless you're willing to go the distance and make a bodysuit. And she's like, what? nothing <laughs> then they just find this cosmic key thing in the cemetery hey what's this <laughs> and it looks like a bomb if any right thinking person anywhere saw this on the ground it looks like an explosive there's nothing about this that looks like an instrument to make music whatsoever any second i expected john lithgow to show up like the manhattan project where he's like you can have that yeah and then evelyn back in gray skull is like skeletor we have detected the use of the key and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, the next time it's used, send a bunch of mercenaries in case it's a trap. I don't want to mm. waste all my good soldiers. Lock in the coordinates. Open a doorway. And uh, look, I realize that mathematically there's no way that they would ever be able to return home. You know what? L- let's do them a solid. We're going to find them. Bring them back here. Br- especially bring back He-Man. He's in the movie still, right? Yes? Good. He-Man is going to come back here and he will kneel before Zod. <laughs> Wait, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Kneel before Skeletor. You can edit that in post. All right, thank you. And so then we cut to He-Man, who's just kind of creeping around a fence at night. Dude, he is wandering around a high school wearing what is clearly a BDSM submissive outfit. Uh huh. He looks like the Grand Marshal of every gay pride parade. Like he is this Adonis, this muscle tanned, oiled up man wearing nothing but straps of leather around his pectoral muscles with a tiny fur loincloth. You know what? I'll give you all of that in the sense that, hey, if this is how you want to dress this character up, fine. The biggest problem, again, is that he doesn't say or do anything that tells you anything about who this character is. Mm -mm. And it's just maddening. Inside the high school, Courtney Cox is there. Remember, she was planning to leave town to catch a bus to get on a plane to Mm -hmm. go to New Jersey. She's just hanging out in this empty high school gymnasium as her boyfriend, Kevin, does a sound check by himself on the stage. He doesn't have a band. I don't think he actually plays in a band. And this gymnasium is decorated with blue and white balloons and blue and white streamers. And the theme is around the world fantasy, which coincidentally enough is the theme of this year's gay pride parade, which coincidentally he man is the grand marshal of oh i could go for an around the world fantasy right now chad <laughs> not gonna lie this entire scene looks like the enchantment under the sea dance from back to the future yeah complete with strickland who's gonna show up here in a minute dude detective principal strickland in this movie he may be working harder than franklin jella <laughs> to really sell his character but he's basically just doing principal strickland from back to the future yeah kevin thinks that this is like oh, yeah, i think this is some kind of newfangled keyboard <laughs> well listen to this I can smell your key. Back at Castle Grayskull, they lock in on the key's signal because Kevin was playing it. And they realize that they are on planet Earth in the year 1987. And Skeletor says, Evelyn, have you assembled the mercenaries to go to Earth to find the key to bring back He-Man? Um, yes. Yes, we did, Skeletor. These are your mercenaries. There's Cog, who you know. Oh, yes, Cog. Cog, wonderful. Wonderful. I love your hair. How it waves back. You look like a, an aged Al Sharpton. Here's a weird-looking reptile guy called Sorod. Mm. I think you like him. I, you know, you definitely worked in the cartoon, yes. There's, Are you like Boba Fett, but a lizard? <laughs> his blade, which you can tell he's got a lot of knives. I think you'll like blade. that. Blade. You know, it's funny. I would have thought maybe he was on rollerblades, but I see how the knives work in his favor. Maybe both. Knives and rollerblades, if you considered that blade. That would be an interesting touch. You could be a triple threat. Short blades, long blades, roller blades. Consider it. Soft suggestion. Not a hard suggestion, but I am Skeletor. I will be the master of the universe. So basically what I'm telling you is I'd like to see you on roller blades. And then finally, uh, Skeletor, here's a big furry we found named Beast Man. Beast Man, yes, I've seen you on the cartoon many, many times. Wonderful, wonderful Beast Man. Rawr. Who did the makeup for this Beast Man? He appears to be this, the Sasquatch from Six Million Dollar Man, if you ask me. And then Skeletor just tells them, so bring He-Man back alive so I can make him kneel in that get-up that he wears that kind of does it for me. Oh, he'll be my slave kneeling down. Oh. I wonder how he likes feet. 
I have skeleton feet, but I still like the toes sucked. Clean the bone. That's what I pay extra for. Clean the bone. He-Man, that's what I'll say to him when he gets here. We go back to Earth, where Kevin is having this guy, Charlie, who owns the local music store, check out the cosmic key. But Courtney Cox is like, hey, I'm just going to hang out in this empty high school to Mm -hmm. say goodbye to the old place. She says that she's not going to be able to graduate. You're like, why not? Do you even go to school? (laughs) She's got a lot going on. I think maybe she got expelled. She's sitting in the gymnasium dealing with her never-ending depression, grief, and suicidal thoughts. And so she opens up this locket and sees pictures of her dead mom and dead dad. And she's like, boo-hoo-hoo. And then the portal door opens and our henchmen show up uh, along with the one character we recognize from the cartoon who's beast man mm-hmm. and a bunch of other uh stormtroopers dressed in black they show up then this character who i'm guessing is the high school janitor we've never met him he comes walking out of a bathroom or something he's wearing a letterman's jacket which then i thought he might be one of those sad sack students who peaked in their senior year of high school and never just left they're just like clinging to those glory days throwing around the ball or whatever and this janitor guy comes out he's like hey you can't be in here and beast man punches this guy in the face so hard that he explodes through a lock set of metal doors and i'm like that guy's dead (laughs) this is a crime scene it turns out that's not the case we'll find out later but you're right this should have been the end of this character he's not making it to see another sunrise but after what happens next he's certainly never going to carry on a conversation again and he won't ever want to look in a mirror even if he did he's I'm not going to recognize who's there. What is that big piece of melted wax? Cornell! (laughs) Get to the pigs, Cornell! So our henchmen all run in. They start blasting up the high school gymnasium. And we have all of these props in there for the end of your dance, the around the world fantasy Mm -hmm. dance. And there is a 30 foot tall Eiffel Tower. There is a matching Big Ben standee. None of this bow belongs in a Masters of the Universe movie. And then all of these laser blasts just set the gymnasium on fire. Fire. And then Beastman rushes to attack Courtney Cox, who's just screaming in fear. And at this point, the whole movie just feels like the Howling Three. Like with this wolf man chasing her as she crawls around under the bleachers. She goes into like some kind of wooden pallet storage facility as she runs out of the high school. Yeah. And runs smack dab into He-Man, who just picks her up and carries her off like King Kong. Yeah. Then they hide for a little bit. He hands her a gun. He's like, you know how you use it like shoot he just gives a strange creature on a planet that he's never been to a weapon <laughs> he just leaves her there while he goes on the hunt and ends up shooting this sorod person and then beats up beast man a little bit and then of course tila and man at arms show up guns blazing which it's also crazy that the four henchmen completely ignore skeletor's orders of bring he-man back alive they're blasting at him slinging a sword they're clearly trying to kill this guy well but i also think that they're under the impression that you can't actually kill a he-man without a stake through the heart oh. and so like the blaster is only gonna hurt him like that's just gonna make him angry <laughs> they run off when man at arms and tila show up and then we just cut away from the scene yep and go to kevin where he's at the record shop where the (laughs) music to purple haze plays yeah and this guy charlie is checking out this cosmic key and it's like oh yeah i seen one of these before it's japanese (laughs) and so they're tinking around with it and there are a bunch of lights that starts dancing over the top of it and charlie the music guy is like hey where'd you find this thing he was like i was in the cemetery again you know how i like to hang out there and just commune for what it's worth a little earlier a couple of uh police officers were here asking about you asking if i'd seen you in the cemetery i mean huh. i told him maybe but charlie i, I tell I, you what why, why don't you come by my place later i'm gonna be down in the basement you know where i oh, got yeah. that well yeah 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 I, i've heard about that well i think you're gonna like it uh how about you come on by and you can look at the well you know that's one of my favorite hobbies is leaning over long deep holes and uh trusting the person behind me it's, it's kind of my thing you know that's why i like 
like you so much, Charlie. We, we, we really complete each other. But then they see a bunch of emergency vehicles pass by. And then Charlie, who has a police bed, apparently just to keep tabs on his buddy Kevin, yeah. learns that the high school is on fire through the, the police band. And so Kevin's like, well, I better get over there. I mean, if she's going to get cooked like a roast pork, I want to be there to see it. Peel the skin off. It's really easy to remove it from the muscles once it's started to, to crackle a little bit. When it goes too far, it essentially turns into pork rinds. So I, I really need to go. You know, Charlie, they call humans long pork because it tasted a lot like pork. My dead grandfather, the one I mentioned earlier, uh -huh. he had two different police band radios in his house. And I remember as a kid on Friday and Saturday nights, that was entertainment. Just listening to crimes being committed around our hometown. That's weird. <laughs> I've known people like that. My grandmother also had a police band radio. Right. And it's just strange. I think he might have been doing it to make sure that nobody was coming after him. That's why he never <laughs> saw you coming. Never in his life did he think it was going to be right. his grandson. Uh, keep your friends close. Keep your enemies closer. Keep your grandchildren super close. Thank you, Grandpa! <gasps> Then we get this cutaway to Dolph Lundgren talking to Courtney Cox. Courtney Cox gets a dose of her own medicine here where he just dumps a bunch of exposition on her about the movie. Describes what the key is and what it does and, and that kind of thing. And there's nothing better than to have a character explain things that you, the audience, already know to someone else. What he says is... She's like, really? Oh my god. Wow, it sounds like we're in trouble. And then they go after Kevin, who, by the way, shows up at the school with this key in hand as mm -hmm. this janitor is being taken out on a stretcher, remembering the last time he ever walked, apparently. With that Letterman jacket infused to his skin from temperatures that he never thought that he would feel. Because the school is blazing to the ground. And this is where Detective Principal Strickland shows up. Yeah. And it's just like, all right, all right, what's happening here? It's really unsettling seeing him in this movie if you've seen back to the future one two or three because he's essentially playing the exact same character absolutely he's just like what are you a slacker kevin's like hey did you see a great big courtney cox inside and he's like no nah, no nah, there wasn't no courtney cox inside but are you sure because she you know has dark hair and she's a little thinner than I'd like because uh -huh. it's harder to mm. cut off. And that's the point where Strickland is like, all right, you're coming with me, pal. We got to ask you some questions downtown. Do you have any evidence on me? You haven't been to my house, have you? You didn't look down on the hole, did you? Oh, jeez. I knew eventually the law would catch up to me. So our heroes meet back up. By heroes, I mean Man-at-Arms and Tila and He-Man. I swear, when you watch this movie, you forget characters are in the film until they just randomly show back up. Including Gwildor, where you're like, where has he been the whole damn time? And then he comes rolling up in a convertible pink Cadillac. Dude. Like, with like a, a straight up Mr. Fusion in the car. I came in and added all of these new enhancements. Beep, pop, or, and he's like dumping Miller Lite and putting banana peels in it and shit. It's all but flying off the ground. My favorite part of this whole scene, though, is when Tila shows up and Courtney Cox is beside him. And He-Man says, oh, you have any luck? And she says, not as much as you, apparently. Rare. That cat's got claws. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought that was funny. But yeah, so they all jump in this pink Mr. Fusion fueled rocket car that Billy Barty has invented. This is a Masters of the Universe movie. What are we doing here, Bo? We cut back to Skeletor and he is kind of fondling Evil Lynn's face. She's on her knees in front of his crotch. You're like, what's going on there? Don't ask. And she's like, Skeletor, we must destroy He-Man because the people wait for him to return. And Skeletor's like, no, he must be broken. And then our mercenaries show back up, all hangdog and mm -hmm. kicking a can in front of them. Hey, Skeletor. What are you doing here? Oh, jeez. Let me ask you all one question. Oh, uh, crap. Is it, do we have He-Man? Because the answer is no. Or if we have the key, no. Hmm. That was the question. Um, Blade. Yes. I need to make an example of someone. And honestly, the rollerblades thing has re me very put out with you. So I've really been practicing really too little too late. I'm afraid blade. And then he just disintegrates him. 
And he says, all right, you assholes, go back. This time you're taking more forces. And Evil Lynn the whole time is like, yeah, yeah, you do that. And he's like, oh, did I forget you, Evil Lynn? Or should I say Evelyn? You're going to be going with him. And she's like, ah, why me? Because you have to lead these idiots. All right, I could do it, but I'm Skeletor. I've got a whole thing to do here with the sorcerers. And I'm about to make another call to the battlefield. Do you know that it's Taco Tuesday tomorrow? So we cut to Courtney Cox, parents' house. Well, I guess it's her house. Maybe it's the bank. Bank's house. I don't know who owns this house anymore. She, remember, she's going to New Jersey. Detective Principal Skinner and Kevin, they just wander inside. And as they're meandering around, Courtney Cox calls her own house and Kevin answers the phone with Detective Principal Skinner nearby. And he plays it real cool. And he's like, hello? Uh, no, Courtney Cox isn't here. Yes. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is definitely not Courtney Cox calling me on the phone. Yes, I have that large metallic music. Uh, uh, cat we were discussing earlier mm. yes it, it well it was nice talking to you not courtney cox goodbye Clay. and then detective principal skinner's like oh, wait a minute wait who are you talking to was that courtney cox what's that metal thing you got in your hand like that's not a cat is it a synthesizer what is this thing i'm pretty sure this is a japanese synthesizer that's what charlie said anyway have you seen charlie he, he was going to my house and looking in the well japanese i fought in ww2 we're not gonna be dealing with any japanese synthesizers not while i'm on the force you're a slacker you always been a slacker kevin again he threatens to take him downtown but we cut away from that because evil lynn is using this scanner thing to see this fight that's already happened here on earth because she and the mercenaries are now you know yeah in, in, in the, the year vicinity. 1987 yeah. yeah, she's given the mercenaries all kinds of shit. Oh, yes, I see that there was a young high school girl here. I guess that's really what the, tipped the scales against you. <laughs> and one of the soldiers is like, hey, Evelyn. Uh, sorry, Evil Lynn. It's uh, Evil Lynn. Sorry. It's a hyphen. It's not an apostrophe. I know that on our internal roster system, it has an apostrophe. It is a hyphen. It's Evil Lynn. Can you get that through your thick skull? Uh, we found the, the key. Oh, well, that's good news. Wanna, Where is it? Uh, over here. Wait, are you pointing somewhere? What are you? Um, close. Uh, just follow me. Okay. And so we cut back to Detective Principal Strickland, who is making these lights appear above the key. And Kevin, by the way, is heating up some chicken uh -huh. in the in microwave. A microwave. Yeah. yeah. And one of the soldiers that was just talking to Evil Lynn is like, hey, uh, we're getting a weird signal that's interfering with our tracker. You want me to blow that thing up? And she's like, yes, yes, blow it up. And so he sends, I guess, a signal or something that remotely blows up Kevin's microwave, which is a real mm -hmm. jerk move. Yeah, blows up his chicken and ribs, too. And Detective Principal Strickland does not seem to be that put out by this turn of events and just keeps questioning Kevin about, like, what the Thing is what's going on with courtney cox and then detective principal strickland is just like give me that key i'm taking it downtown yeah at which point these mercenaries blast through courtney cox's door and just attack kevin evil Lynn comes in and she says hand me wonder woman's lasso of truth oh, we don't have one then give me the the collar of mostly not lies and so they slap this collar on Kevin around his neck and he just starts spouting off all the truth of where they found the cosmic key and he went to Charlie and Detective S Principal Skinner has it and that's where he's headed now because that's going to be a perfect location for this lackluster action sequence we're about to have in our yeah and during this scene, one of the henchmen finds a newspaper clipping detailing that Courtney Cox's parents are dead from a plane crash, because that's going to be needed later. So after Kevin spills the beans on where the cosmic key is, at that point, they just leave Kevin there to stare off in the distance with this magical lasso stand in around his neck. When Eva Lynn and her henchmen and these random dark stormtroopers all exit the house, they climb into this thing that looks like a space swamp boat and they just fly off into the night sky pretty fancy hovercraft but yeah and then the pink cadillac containing all our heroes shows up right after to yeah. find kevin inside with this collar around his neck hey sorry about that but that dominatrix came in here and really gave me what for and i gotta tell you <laughs> it was pretty hot they're on their way down to charlie's music store for a disappointing action sequence as soon as they take the collar off he 
just picks up a chair and starts to make like he's gonna bounce it off of he-man yeah and tila of course quick on the draw shoots it out of his hands and then courtney cox is like no 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 don't shoot him he's with me he's fine at that point billy barty shows up in a bunch of stolen human clothes that is one of the attempts at humor in this movie but yeah they decide like hey we gotta go to charlie's because that's where strickland is headed with the cosmic key they're like all right we'll take us there and kevin's like um I don't think so. You guys are a bunch of freaks. And Courtney Cox is like, well, I disagree. Let's go. And so they do. They all head down to the music store. The pink Cadillac shows up. He-Man and crew rush inside to find Detective Principal Skinner. And he just pulls a gun on him. Detective Principal Skinner says, look, slackers, I want some answers. Let's start with you, Blondie. And then Gwildor comes wandering in and Detective Principal Skinner shouts, what the hell is that? Maybe the best moment in the movie is him just being like, what the fuck is this thing? At some point, Detective Principal Skinner's police issued weapon falls into the hands of Tila, mm-hmm. and she forces him into the back office and then at this point Gwildor is trying to use the cosmic key to triangulate a return to castle grayskull or something kevin shows up and he's like pretty good at playing music would you like me to maybe give it a try and he's like oh that would be a great idea so these two are starting to bond and then we get this shootout at charlie's used musical instrument emporium with a bunch of those black colored stormtroopers and it's all very boring again badly edited it's just them inside this music store it's not like a big battle it's like you're shooting at each other 10 feet away basically if you've ever been involved in a playful nerf gun battle it's it's like that only slightly more what do i want to say stupid and it causes fire like if your nerf darts somehow set a drum kit on fire that's what's going on here. and then tila giving really the, bang, only, bang, 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 bang! the only gift she knows how to give she throws mm. kevin a gun and, and it's like hey protect the key from detective principal strickland and then she shoots some dudes and said they need a woman's touch a woman at arms Aww. and you're like oh god this movie is worse than i thought it was maybe they'll call me a mistress of the universe and evelyn's like shut up that's my title oops sorry i thought your name was evelyn no it's evelyn there's a hyphen i shoot them that was an apostrophe shut up detective principal strickland is trying to go after the gun and he's threatening kevin with jail and while they're scuffling courtney cox looks out the window during this gunfight and sees her mom standing outside uh her dead mom right and so she slips outside and evil lynn clearly is pretending to be her mom and is like hey honey i'm sorry we had to disappear and fake that plane crash but can you scamper in there and get a cosmic key thingy for us and then we can all go home oh mom i'll do anything you ask i'll be right back Thump, 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 thump. Thump, 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 thump. here it is ha ha i'm evelyn i'm not your mother it's in my name evil lynn also inside billy barty has to get the gun and fire off a shot into the ceiling to chill everybody out yeah everybody be cool this is a robbery <laughs> courtney cox is screaming because evil lynn has revealed herself and at that point all the soldiers retreat because they got where, what they came for and then the r- pursuit goes the other way where now all of he-man and his goons are following evil lynn and her goons detective principal strickland leads the charge he gets a shotgun from charlie who keeps it behind the counter this is basically just a glorified pawn shop and then detective <laughs> principal strickland he runs outside he's like free slackers and then these black stormtroopers excuse me stormtroopers with black armor uh-huh. they turn around and just start shooting at him as he's hiding behind a car and the car just explodes he has to make a break for it and duck he's the only character that really curses a lot in this movie he's just like god damn it holy shit he's basically playing every detective character from a fincher movie evil end sends a signal to skeletor beep boop boop ghost is clear and then another portal opens and skeletor comes riding in on this parade float with his imperial guard troops marching along in front of him also there are no citizens of this nameless town in 1987 the only people that we see living here were out at the rib shack and that's it also when skeletor comes through there are these dudes i think he calls them air centurions and the ones who glide around on those little shields right and never move it it is one of the 
shittiest effects in a movie filled with shitty effects Mm -hmm. it is shocking how bad it is it's like if you basically put those green army men that have the bazooka on their shoulder on a stick and ran it in front of the screen yeah and then twirled it Mm -hmm. every now and again to make it look like they were going up over a building yeah it looks terrible it looks really really bad it's terrible anyway so a bunch of soldiers follow along with skeletor these area centurions evil lynn is like we have the key and skeletor is like yes 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 but do you have he-man that is what i want we have the key evelyn i tell you i want he-man because i want him to be my slave look i'm very clear on this i've been clear on the hyphen versus the apostrophe all right oh evelyn get over it somebody didn't bring donuts friday morning for donut friday and it wasn't me get when i look at the sign-in sheet it says evel apostrophe lynn evelyn are you telling me that wasn't you you weren't supposed to pick up crispy creams on friday evelyn i'm sorry skelet or oh well now you're going to be in big trouble. Whatever you say, skelet or ah, just find he man. And so our heroes go from pursuit, and now they're running away, and they get in some kind of building, like an abandoned building, all Samaritan style. Uh huh. And Dolph Lundgren uses this grappler to get himself one of these hoverboards and starts flying around, which also looks like shit. He man is chasing these centurions, right through the sky. <laughs> well, he shoots one of them and his whole body explodes like a balloon right like what are these things made of c4 i don't know they're like pinatas or something maybe candy blew out everywhere and then he swings by where evelyn is and fires the grappling hook at her and just yoinks the cosmic key out of her hands and she's like oh no and he does this like dipsy doodle to get away with it where he flies the aerial equivalent of the triple lindy yep where he flies over this dude's head and comes around behind him and then blows him up with by hitting him with a sword and then Skeletor is just like, ah, son of a bitch. All right, look, you Sky Centurion, I need you to act as bait. You need to lead He-Man to me. And <clears throat> while that is going on, while there's this aerial battle taking place, I mean, battle in quotes. Right. And Skeletor rises up in his fancy hovercraft up to the roof of this building where our heroes are hiding. And he's like, I see you. Don't. And so he demands that they throw down their weapons, which they do. And they are taken yep. prisoner. And that's where He Man shows up and is like, Who's other not friends? Courtney Cox shouts out, No, He Man, it's a trap. And then Skeletor shoots her in the leg with his pink finger lightning. Mm-hmm. And then at this point, He Man lands and does sword battle with these dark stormtroopers. And through all of this, Skeletor ends up getting the cosmic key. Yes. And he says, He Man, I'm going to give you a choice. Return with me. As my, quote, slave. Won't be so bad. You'll learn. <laughs> Some of it you'll really enjoy. And I also need you to surrender your sword, as well as that long metal thing you carry. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. You know what I meant with sword. Or else I'm going to kill all your friends. And He-Man takes his sword and he's like, clunk. They go back to Eternia with He-Man as Skeletor's slave. Yeah. And they take his sword uh-huh. and leave his friends to right. die. And Tila then checks out Courtney Cox's wound. Goo! Oh my god! This is another one of those moments where it's disgusting, of course. It's bubbling and green. And somebody needs to say the line, only attorney and magic can save her. But that's not what they say. They're just like, oh, she's a goner. Tila's like, I'm shooting off her leg. Billy Barty says like, the other cosmic key is fried. There's no way we're getting back. We're really fucked. And then Kevin says, hey, there's a fountain down on the ground. We should go down there and get some disgusting water from it and put it on Courtney Cox's leg. That way I can peel off the skin more readily. Give her some dysentery. (sighs) Meanwhile, Detective Principal Strickland has led all the cops to this area. There was a bunch of slackers here. I swear bunch of soldiers in a flying air swamp boat it was all here i promise all right drunky <laughs> and of course he looks like an idiot and billy party again says hey there's no hope here skeletor fried the key and we don't know the tones and that's where kevin's like wait a second did you say tones because like i've had this song stuck in my head that came out of that cosmic key thingy all day and it goes like this do 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 
Yeah, that's it. That's legally different from that thing from the other movie. <laughs> and like Billy Barty is just beside himself happy about this. And for no good reason, Kevin just goes, yeah, I guess I'm kind of a failure. And you're like, what? No, you just saved the day. What are you talking about? Why is this suddenly Kevin's story as the hero of the film? I have no idea. Billy Barty, again, doing his all here is like, Kevin, look, you're not just one of a million musicians. Only one of you. Only one of anybody. And it's like, oh, well, that's kind of a nice line and a nice sentiment and maybe would have been a good theme for the movie if the movie had a theme. No, it does not. To get back, the man at arms has to hand over an octide rectifier, which is definitely a sex toy. Tila says i'll shoot it a few times like no no bam 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 too late and so kevin's like hey how about i go get a keyboard so we can end this fucking movie we're so close to the end of it we are in the home stretch because what happens is back at castle grayskull he man is led to the throne upon which skeletor sits you know yes dick level right and somebody says we're half a preton to moonrise and you're like all right whatever you say <laughs> i'm going to assume that means soon and the sorceress is getting all <laughs> old and wrinkled in her force field like she got beetle juiced yeah <laughs> And then Skeletor takes this, the sword of Grey Skull and puts it in a fancy slot on the throne. He's like, oh, that's the good stuff. So, He Man, kneel. And He Man's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's like is, is that a no? Because I, it sounded like a negative tone, but I don't want to assume here because you might have said yes. Oh, mm -hmm. but, but you're also not kneeling. So maybe we should try to coerce you into kneeling in front of me. You are my slave. You are, after all. That was the agreement. You agreed. No takesies, backsies. I saw your fingers. None of them were crossed. Nor were your eyes. And the fact that your toes might have been crossed doesn't count. Because he won't kneel, he just gets electro whipped for his troubles by some dude. Dude, it's like Denzel and Glory. <laughs> yeah, right. They're cracking this whip on his back nonstop. Morgan Freeman's in the corners telling Skeletor, shoes, sir. He just wanted <laughs> shoes. That's another one of those movies. You and I snuck off to drive 45 minutes to go see in another city with a little little more culture i you know what i went to see that with you and i went back the next day to see it on your own yeah i love that movie still do glory's a great movie we were definitely different kids that, there is no <laughs> doubt about that glory glory <laughs> glory you know the director is the guy behind 30 something i know he also wrote the episode i'm nobody who are you you're telling me something i don't know <laughs> One of the best episodes of the series. Oh. Perfectly marries Dickensian poetry and middle age on we. <laughs> Detective Private Strickland is being taken home for a, a long rest when he sees this pink Cadillac zoom by and he's like, hey, that's a thing with the guy. Whatever, sure. Kapow, kapow. <laughs> Kevin shows up with his keyboard and Billy Barty has done some real E.T. phone home bullshit here. Yeah. Where there are wires going everywhere. This makeshift cockamamie device of his. Absolutely. Billy Barty is so delighted by this keyboard Kevin has. So why didn't you tell me you had a sonic shmobilizer? Yeah. And he's like, because that's not what we call it here, you weird looking little runt. Hey, how loose is your skin? It looks real <laughs> loose. Your face especially, it looks like a scrotal sack that's been deflated. I'm kind of into this. Uh, hey, let's talk after this whole adventure is over. I've got a well to show you. <laughs> Meanwhile, Courtney Cox is in real rough shape here. Ah! My leg! <laughs> Kevin goes to her and he's like, Listen, I've never said this to anyone because it's hard for me to feel feelings, but I love you, you know? And she's like, I know. I just don't know if I'll ever walk or act again. Yeah. Done with them. We go back to Skeletor just taunting He-Man and is like, So... Would you like to kneel now, He-Man? The moon is at its apex. I'm about to have all the power in the universe. While this is happening, we see that Detective Principal Strickland is moving in on our heroes with his shotgun. He's going to shoot him and kill him. Skeletor, back in Eternia, because we're kind of bouncing back and forth between these two sets, Skeletor does another of his hollow fireside chats where he's like, Listen, everyone, I just wanted to give you the good news. He-Man is my slave. I've got the sword. And also, I'm about to be master of the universe. It's very exciting. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much. And then this glowing yellowish orange orb comes down and starts filling him up with all of this light. And it crescendos to the point to where his entire costume 
changes. And now he's wearing this metallic gold plate armor, but he's got this wild, fancy gold headdress full of multiple horns. It's sort of the Kate Blanchett Gila costume. Yeah. Uh, only, only gold. yellow. Yeah. So Skeletor wins, movie's over, right? He demands He-Man kneel again. Kneel. And then starts shooting more force lightning out of his eyes this time. Then back on Earth, just as Detective Principal Strickland shows up, they get this device working again. The door opens up and they blast in just as Skeletor is asking He-Man, So, where are your friends now, He-Man? And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, there. Yeah. Oh, well, hmm, that's serendipitous. Um, <laughs> huh, that was supposed to be rhetorical, but here, here they are. Dark Stormtroopers, kill them! And then a battle breaks out in Castle Grayskull. They show up with a chunk of the street they were on behind him as well. Half the pink Cadillac is there, like three quarters of a phone booth. And it looks exceedingly cheap, as yeah. every part of this movie does. Detective Principal Strickland just starts blasting fools with his shotgun. Then He-Man gets freed when Skeletor tries to zap him with his eyes again and He-Man just like puts the shackles in the way then He-Man grabs the sword from the slot where Skeletor put it in the chair and then in a wide shot that doesn't make sense for the, the first moment in the movie where He-Man grabs the sword holds it over his head and says I have the power his catchphrase yes it's not a shot of him doing it I mean he's in the shot but he's like far left yeah and it's a real throwaway kind of thing i don't know that i noticed that he even did it until the second time through <laughs> and then they just pose and start fighting with their swords and staff and whatnot and sparks and lights are happening while they swing at each other and one thing I really liked about this scene in uh, early Disney films, they would use the choreography from one film to essentially inform another. So there's a scene where Snow White is dancing with the dwarves and that same choreography was used in Robin Hood. And I really liked during this fight sequence, how they essentially took the scene where Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader beat the shit out of each other in Return of the Jedi and did that exact same thing. It's embarrassing how much of this is the end of Return of the Jedi. Up to and including He-Man whacking him with a sword and him falling off the ledge into this empty pit of nothingness. Like, oh! It's a real anti-climax where he just, yeah, like you said, he gets tossed over the side of this thing. And then immediately this moon door closes and the sorceress is cool. And that's it. It's shockingly anticlimactic. You're just like, um, all right, I guess yep. that's the end of it. And that's it. And then we see all of our characters preparing to end the movie. Detective Principal Strickland has decided to stay in Eternia because he now has a female slave prostitute on his arm. I got this girl here. Uh, I'm going to fuck one of the locals for a couple of decades. <laughs> and, uh, you know, best of luck back on Earth. Who cares? Kevin and Courtney Cox, they decide to return to Earth. The sorceress gives Courtney Cox a little blue ball to keep in her hand for safe something to make sure you never forget Eternia. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to remember this shit, you know? Yeah. And then Courtney Cox, she's like welling up with tears because she's so sad, Bo, to leave the friends that she met three hours ago. That is also in my notes of why are you getting emotional? Why are any of you getting emotional over this girl <laughs> that you brought here to save? Like, good on you for doing that. But right. what do you know about this person other than she happened to be in the building and pointed you to the guy who had the key? That's it. They know nothing of her life or her dead parents or her plan plans to go to new jersey up to and including man at arms giving her this big speech about you know um they we have a little saying here on a, a attorney uh live the journey for every destination is but a doorway to another and you know i know that's a, a little confusing but it, it's basically uh you, you move from one place to another in the the journey along the way but uh what i'm saying is you know come back and see us sometime that's all maybe you could shorten that to something like yes we can just uh, a thought i'm thinking just uh, keep it simple hope just hope yeah they're just hugging their way around the room for no good reason. Uh, Wildor says, hey, if you guys want, I could send you back to a different time if that would be beneficial to you. And they're like, nah, we're good. Just send us back to when we left. But at the last minute, they, so they start going back through the door and that's where Courtney Cox is like, oh, but wait, what do I think? 
but they're through. I've not tried to make this film better. Uh -huh. But why wouldn't they have Gwildor be like, I can send you back to any time you want? And have her say like, yes. To be able to respond like, I know exactly what I want you to send. And then cut away. Right. Cut away to what happens next. Instead, you get the, oh, you, oh wait, hold on a second. Bye. <laughs> right. But she wakes up in a Victorian era sleeping gown. Yes. In her old house. And it's a whole thing where she goes downstairs and her parents are like cooking dinner and stuff mom dad and they're there and they're like hey hon we're just on our way to go fly in a plane and she's like bull to the shit you are <laughs> yeah. mom's like no your dad's an excellent pilot he's a drunk and he's cheating on you but i'm not gonna let you two die and she grabs the keys and just runs off like they can't call a taxi you know like this is not as good a plan as she thinks it is the keys she took were for the lawnmower i know <laughs> Maybe she's going to mow the lawn later? I don't know. Let's go fly around on the plane. Yeah. Where's my flask? <laughs> Stay away from my second cell phone. It's weird that it's later in the movie that they do that reveal that he was flying. Yeah. Anyway. So she runs out, and sure enough, there's Kevin waiting for her outside. Oh, you want, I need your help me to put this couch on the back of my van. You can't let your parents get on that plane. Look, I got some people sniffing around about my involvement, and if that <laughs> thing doesn't blow up, nobody's in the wiser. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got their keys. Those are the boat keys that's why it's got the floaty thing on it so if you drop them in the water also it says boat keys oh shit well door and then they kind of look in this blue orb that they have and they're like oh it was all real it was like wait was that in question did you think it was a dream <laughs> all along i didn't i didn't get that vibe <laughs> the fact that your parents are now alive again right that seems I like the know. proof right <laughs> sure they look into this blue orb and there is he-man raising his sword aloft and yelling oh bo. and that's it and and then credits there's a post credit scene oh yes there is because at the very 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 end of the credits skeletor pops up from some red liquid muck and he says i'll be back even in the last moments of this film it reeks of unoriginality it is shocking chad the way he says it is i'll be back yeah and you're like, no, you won't. <laughs> it's wishful thinking, I'm afraid, my friend. And not only is this movie incredibly derivative, we haven't really dabbled in the how do we fix this movie thing because it so fundamentally misunderstands what this movie needs to be. Like, He-Man just doesn't have a character. And for this movie to work, he's got to be a hero. And you've got to understand what he wants because all he wants in this movie is to stop Skeletor who wants this power. But apparently He-Man has the power, question mark. It is just the laziest piece of shit that we have watched. But is it? Because, Chad, it is time with the season finale that we rate the movies that we watched this season. A season, I would argue, filled with some of the worst movies we've done as a collection. Yes. And we've watched a lot of bad movies and had a lot of bad seasons. You told me this cannot be a six-way tie. <laughs> for just garbage <laughs> yeah that's right if i had to rank them and it's not from best to worst like that's that's an impossible task uh -uh. i think that when i rank them i rank these in an order if i met someone on the street which of these movies would i have them watch mm -hmm. and have them hate me the least for recommending that they watch this movie uh-huh you want me to go first uh yeah sure all right i'm gonna go from best to worst okay my number one this season and i feel disgusting <laughs> and embarrassed and ashamed that i'm gonna say this, my number one is perfect oof Right. Because if I had to recommend this to someone, it's entertaining enough to watch Jamie Lee Curtis and John Travolta do their best with this terrible movie. I've got a bunch of dirtbag friends who would enjoy watching all of the women writhe around in their skimpy little clothes. So that was my number one. My number two, I can't believe I'm saying this, is the Emoji Movie. Ooh, wow. Because I'm, I am not proud of this. <laughs> Because when you watch it, you're going to be reminded of better films. And you'll be thinking about those better movies. Uh, I suppose. Number three is The Jerky Boys. And here's the thing. The reason Perfect and Emoji Movie were one and two, they were at least somewhat original and weren't completely derivative of something that existed in a very specific way in pop culture. So Jerky Boys was number three. Because I don't think if anybody watched it, they would understand what the hell's going on. The Super Mario Brothers movie, you either know Mario Brothers brothers or you don't either way this movie doesn't make any sense whatsoever my number five is masters of the universe and my number six is garbage pail kids because it's just intolerable 
It's mm-hmm. the, that movie is nothing but grotesque filler trying to get past the 79 minute mark so that they can put it in theaters to try to make a buck or two, which they didn't. All right. Oof. There's some definite disagreement amongst our, our list for sure. So my number one best of the season is the Jerky Boys movie because it reminded me of things that I found funny. Not the movie itself, but Alan Arkin makes me laugh sometimes. The Jerky Boys records made me laugh. I can see that. It's just a cipher for other better things. My second is strangely Masters of the Universe hmm. because it's relatively short. Like you won't remember a thing about it once it's over with. And and I think that there are good performances in it. I mean, it's a terrible movie and you shouldn't watch it and all of that. But there's at least something to it. Um, okay. Masters of the Universe is my number two. Super Mario Brothers is my number three because it's just so weird and batshit crazy. All right. Number four is perfect because it's so fucking boring. And even with John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis, who can be perfectly charming on their own, this movie somehow makes them just as dull as the rest of it right because 90 percent of the dialogue takes place over telephone yes calls. yeah uh number five is the emoji movie because it's uh, a god-awful travesty of uh, filmmaking yes and number six is the garbage pail kids movie because everything about it screams we do not care yes i'm happy that we both agreed on our bottom everything else is really hundredths of a percentage point difference in its terribleness this is truly a season of, of terrible 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 movies this is one of the worst that we have done i mean as a set of movies like no one film is the worst film we ever saw but at taken as a group it is a great grim set of movies next season we're gonna do better because we can't do worse sure (laughs) so to kick off next season but you know summertime's coming up oh love the summer chad you love the summer and you know there's nothing more american than just hitting the open road Mm -hmm. and taking a road trip right oh i love a road trip too what if bo Uh we did six movies that were all road trip film in celebration of summer (laughs) yeah but that means we're not doing six good road trip movies maybe there might be a couple of interesting less not so terrible road trip movies in there all right well i like the sound of that let me give you for example to kick off this season bo one of the most iconic road trip movies of all time Uh is national lampoon's vacation oh that's and i thought why not do national lampoon's vacation but the the remake the one with ed helms and christina applegate oh no yeah it's a movie no one asked for it's a movie most people didn't like (sighs) i mean (laughs) i guess we gotta start somewhere and if that's the case i think the season should be titled holiday road i think that's a great idea (laughs) and one i've clearly heard before so come back and join us in uh in two weeks time or whenever the hell we we post this next episode and we will start six road trip movies and here's the god's honest truth we don't know what these six movies are going to be so if you have a recommendation if you have a road trip movie because there's a lot of them across a lot of different genres that you would like to hear us talk about the history the people and and the misguided decisions that made that movie you can send that to us at pick six movies at gmail.com you can find us on social media you can write us a letter you can talk to us in the grocery store i get it we're celebrities but we're just like regular people Mm -hmm. you know we throw cans of soup at our assistants just like you do i've got a wicker basket of double a batteries i know you do because you have better aim than me your eyesight is so much better so come back and see us in two weeks time as we kick off our next season of holiday road featuring six movies that are all about road trips bo do you have any final thoughts as it relates to masters of the universe before i go back through this door do you guys have wells in attorney (laughs) i'm gonna take that as a yes (laughs) we'll see everybody in two weeks time